uh, Wilson. Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. We have on our panel today, and hopefully in the audience as well, people from various time zones. Uh, some of us sipping our evening tea, some of us doing the morning beverage. And uh, that's the, the silver lining to the pandemic and lockdown is that we're able to get together like this uh, in ways that we couldn't or didn't very often at other times. But welcome to Poetry with Prakriti. Uh, very briefly, I am here to introduce the festival to you, to those of you who are here for the first time. Uh, before that, Prakriti Foundation <coughs> is uh, an arts and culture NGO based in Chennai in Tamil Nadu. And uh, they do a number of festivals through the year, festivals and other events, um, which are all about and across the arts, where you have creators of various kinds, academics, critics, audiences, uh, people who love the arts, coming together to interact, to experience one another, to chat and uh, promote the arts. One of the very many festivals that they do is Poetry with Prakriti. Poetry with Prakriti is usually live in Chennai, in person, where you have poets performing their work in a number of different venues, which range from the usual suspects, bookshops, art galleries, that kind of thing, to the unusual things like bus depots and shopping malls and street venues and everything like that. Uh, when I was at Poetry with Prakriti 10, 11 years ago, uh, primary school children, uh, you know, an art gallery, a school, a college, uh, English department. And it's just this beautiful thing of just taking poetry out of its usual confines into a number of different areas, plus being able to hang out with poets from all over India and where budgets permitted from other parts of the world as well. That is Poetry with Prakriti. But uh, last year, it became clear around this time of year, a little bit earlier, that it would not be possible to do a do an in-person poetry with Prakriti because pandemic and uh, the restrictions in travel, the restrictions in public gathering. And so Prakriti decided to do this festival online. And so for the first three Saturdays of every month, there has been a, a different poet each weekend uh, performing their work and interacting with an audience. All these are being recorded. Some of them have come up already on uh, Prakriti's YouTube channel, and we'll share links for all of that eventually. Um, today's event is presented to you by Alliance Francais, uh, Madras, uh, Chennai, and uh, we have actual French speakers in the room, so I hope I haven't butchered that. Uh, the uh, French Embassy in India and Anna Adarsh College in Chennai. Uh, our moderator for today is Tuhin, Tuhin Boal. He's a poet and a translator, and he is also poetry editor at the Bengaluru Review, Sonic Boom Journal, and Yavanika Press. He will be taking you through the rest of this evening, and I'll come back at the end only to say the thank yous. And I'm going to sit back and enjoy an evening of poetry in English and French. And uh, to him, it's over to you for the rest of the evening to steer us through. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks so much. Uh, first of all, I mean, thank you all for joining uh, from whichever part of the world you are. Uh, I am sitting in the city of Bhuvaneshwar, Odisha in India. Uh, and uh, thanks to Rohan for letting me do this. Uh, to, be, to be honest, I was surprised when he asked me, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's poetry and translation. And you know, it's the best thing which could have happened to me in these days of lockdown, yet lockdown. Uh, thank you, Eric, for joining us. Uh, so not to go into the uh, you know, mode of formal uh, bio reading sort of a regime, but uh, Ro Rohan is a writer and translator. His, his first book was Slow Startled, which came out about five years ago. 
And now, as you uh, all must be aware, the second book has come out, Lost Heard and Beautiful Transit from HarperCollins and fellow Passivities. I think it's 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 due to come out uh, in, in the UK as well, right, Rohan? Uh, I think Platypus Press is, is, is the publisher. Uh, Eric? Uh, has been interacting and uh, translating Rohan's poem uh, into the Greek and French, or is it only French, right, French. Uh, Eric? Yeah, yeah, only French. Sorry about that. Yeah. So I think uh, they they met in in one of the retreats in Sangam House, based out of Bangalore, and that's how their collaboration has begun uh, with uh, the translation uh, of of Rohan's uh, poems into into the English, right? Yeah, so over to Rohan and Eric now, and uh, let, let the read start. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Thank you, uh, Tuhin, <clears throat> for that introduction. Um, I guess we will start with, um, uh, with, with the reading from the book. Um, I'll be reading from, as Tuhin mentioned, Lost Hurt or In Transit Beautiful, which has just come out. Uh, in India with this cover and uh, the, the poem I'll be starting with will be uh, the format of the reading will be I'll be reading the, the, the original poem and Eric will be following up with the French versions and we will go on for about 20 to 30 minutes. So the first poem is King Streetery. King Speedery. After the rape and the bloodbath, the savage king and his men retired to a long shed built in an open field by a thin river fashioned for this lull in the pillaging so the horses could rest. One by one, they scrubbed blood off their fingers and faces and sat down to devour a feast of rice and goat served by the villagers. The legend remains only in the name of a lodge built in the same place, which from the Bengali means the king's feedery, where the king took his meal. We say death stays here when it visits someone in the family. The time it came for grandfather, it arrived late not at the wolf's hour between midnight and first light, but late morning on the highway, siren blaring all the way to the nursing home. As if punishing us for what it botched, it hung around for a few months at the feedery and came for my aunt. Young, suffering in a marriage, she was taken straight by her weak heart I imagine them, father and daughter, sitting still across a table, sharing a meal of steaming boiled potatoes and always in the afterlife, that vague dream of salt. Death takes in threes, they said. We feared it would come for one of us. In the trashed room, they found death's ledger full of illegible scrawls in a dark meter no one could understand. Grandmother's devastation circled complete that year. A channel of clear water began thrumming beneath her skin. We heard it rumble whenever she opened her mouth to speak. When I think of love, I think of her weeping as I left her swollen lip grazing the back of my hand through the car window, brief and bright her long blurred life now summoned with death lurking at the borders again. Married at 13, adolescence lost, weeping into a cauldron of chopped onions. She talks of the flimsy wooden hovel perched on four freight stumps and in her telling it is always how she saw it first, herself decked in gold with that sinking dread, a preface. I think of love and I think how, when they lifted grandfather's beer, she called out to him crying, my child, 
my God, my child. La mangerie du roi. Après le viol et le bain de sang, le roi sauvage et ses hommes se retirèrent sous une longue grange située dans un champ à proximité d'un fin cours d'eau afin de marquer une pause dans le pillage et de permettre aux chevaux de se reposer. L'un après l'autre, ils se frottèrent leurs mains et leurs visages couverts de sang et s'assirent pour dévorer un festin de riz et de chèvres servi par les villageois. Il ne subsiste de la légende que le nom d'une auberge construite sur les lieux qui, en Bengali, signifie « la mangerie du roi », l'endroit où le roi prit son repas. On dit que lorsqu'elle rend visite à quelqu'un dans une famille, la mort s'y arrête. Le jour où elle est venue pour grand-père, il était tard. Pas entre chien et loup, mais à la fin de la matinée, sur l'autoroute, sirène stridente tout au long du chemin jusqu'au dispensaire. Comme pour nous faire payer ce qu'elle bousillait, elle s'attarda quelques mois à la mangerie, puis vint chercher ma tante. Jeune, malheureuse en mariage, son faible cœur lâcha et elle fut emportée d'un coup. Je les imagine, le père et la fille, assis à table tranquillement face à face, partageant un plat de pommes vapeur bouillante et, toujours dans l'au-delà, ce vague rêve de sel. La mort prend par trois, disaient les gens. Nous craignons qu'elle vienne pour l'un de nous. Dans la pièce dévastée, ils trouvèrent le registre de la mort rempli de gribouillis illisibles dans un maître obscur que personne ne put comprendre. La dévastation de grand-mère fut complète cette année-là. Un courant d'eau claire se mit à tambouriner sous sa peau. Nous l'entendions gargouiller chaque fois qu'elle ouvrait la bouche pour parler. Quand je pense à l'amour, je pense à elle pleurant lors de mon départ, à ses lèvres boursouflées baisant le dos de ma main à travers la vitre de la voiture. Prompte et lumineuse, voilà que sa longue vie dans l'ombre est convoquée, la mort rôdant dans les parages à nouveau. Mariée à 13 ans, adolescence gâchée à pleurer dans un chaudron d'oignons rondelles, elle évoque la frêle masure perchée sur quatre manchons, et à l'entendre, c'est ainsi qu'elle lui est de prime d'abord apparue, elle-même parée d'or, avec cet effroi insistant, un préambule. Je pense à l'amour et à son appel éploré lorsqu'on a soulevé la bière de grand-père. Mon enfant, mon Dieu, mon enfant. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think the second poem um, I want to read is Lamentation for a Failed Revolution. Um, um, this poem derives its antiphonal structure loosely from the Moiroloi and the ritual lament tradition in ancient Greek. Um, so the second part, I will try to change the intonation uh, and the tone a little bit, which is supposed to be an antiphonal section. Long summer of bullets, one July morning, a caesura in the terror, a lull in the pelting, a man woke in the shape of a crosshair looking for a pharmacy. He heard it before he white blow above ear, then blank, then black blood sluicing down an eye, his open mouth vacuum still on the incline of a sidewalk fistful of pipelines twisting into the asphalt beside his head, his hand clutching dust, body's plate, fossil ripe, martyring. 
The autocrat was a small woman in white with old stitch marks on her head. On the TV, we heard a speech about time having come to replace our tongues. We will start with your children, she said. It will be painless. We'll bring our best. It was an appendage they wanted to sew into our little ones while the low vaults of their mouths were still busy with a simple underswell of small hurt and hunger. I sat at home paralyzed on TV blared their newsrooms, gagged hours, boarded, nailed, shut, I watched the Turin horse, that horse manifesting a dumb mutiny in a world about to go still. Winter of 1986, grandfather home after, a week in the lockup, hung by the feet, baton blued, calves taste of dirt, black he could never spit out, his quietness. A tall house with the wiring, blown, no word about the revolution. We speak only of his quietness after the long, rich hours of his sleep. One morning, the troops swarmed into town like ants around spilled tea. Weary and hungry, they stormed our hearts. We fed them. They were starved. They traveled so far. The trials began the following night. They dragged our children's fathers down to the river, held them by the hair, pulled their tongues out of their mouths, taut like catgut. Some looked embarrassed, so young, some of them. One cracked a joke. They all laughed. Be still, someone whispered. The river raved and raved, eating up the moaning, turning hollow in our mouths. Another afternoon, a 15-year-old boy heard the bullet tucked to breast like a second heart, pain's rubbery percussion. The way he looked up, mouth a shocked oyster wobble, alive in the elongating horror, nurse dressing a medieval coin-sized chunk of skin fallen off the areola, where a round radiating wound his mother beside him, beside herself. You're lucky they didn't shoot you with lead. Every failed revolution is a child learning the edge of himself. Every revolution is a child grown before fire. First, the soldiers thought the roaring came from within the river, some force answering the fog. Then they saw us, the widening pack of us, Moving through trees, they dropped their guns, scurried to the barracks downtown. Next morning, we woke and we brushed and braided each other's hair and we marched and we had no choice. Low humming in the streets at first, then fire, soot, blood darkening asphalt, shards of tube lights, flaring car bonnets. Overnight, the hills groan with eyes, with teeth, with target. One morning we woke to the coughing vampire in a child's body, century old, smelling of taxidermy and treaty, bad memory teething, blood thirst. One morning we woke, it was the revolution. Again, season of ash, men, bone and flesh. Before that cool mornings, Humid afternoons long, evenings brief monsoon march to power cuts. They made love as electrocuted crows smoked above power lines. Before that, I will not name them. I want their debts to be meaningless, full of rest. Soon we understood what we were up against. An unfathomable hatred. They hated us just like they hated those others. Like we hated those others, the butchers, the untouchables. We imagined we were better. They'll treat us better, we thought. Our infants wailed in hunger as the first bodies began to fall. Someone said, they are shooting us only in the faces. The holes in our temples opened into an abandoned factory yard where our dead sat around a bonfire of flags. No lord in the torched kingdom 
we heard in the town zoo, the animals, a shirtless man self-immolated howled curses up a hill as his comrades chased, beating him down with coattails, trying to douse the flames swarming his face, trail of pain, thick blood on the rain, streets where they dragged two baby red pandas were born in captivity on the 29th day of the curfew. We named them. Bodies falling through crossfire, smoke, tear gas shells, bullets plunged from the hands of 20 year olds brought up in the hard streets of small towns just like ours, given guns first, then made to be afraid of us. Um, I will read now the, the French version. If, if on the screen uh, you could show the, the disposition of your poem while I'm reading it uh, in French, I think it will be very enriching for, 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 for your listeners. Lamentation, lamentation pour une révolution manquée. Longue été de bal, un matin de juillet, une césure dans la terreur, une accalmie dans la mitraille, un homme s'est réveillé en ligne de mire à la recherche d'une pharmacie. Il l'entendit avant de coups cinglants au-dessus de l'oreille, puis un blanc, ensuite du sang noir dégoulinant d'un œil, sa bouche b inerte sur le bord d'un fossé, quelques canalisations tordues dans l'asphalte, jouxtant sa tête, sa main, à grippe de la poussière, corps écartelé, mur pour la fossilisation, martyr. L'autocrate était une petite femme en blanc avec des cicatrices sur la tête. À la télé, on entendit que l'heure était venue de remplacer nos langues. « Nous commencerons par vos enfants, » dit-elle. « Ce sera un dolor, nous ferons de notre mieux. » Il s'agissait d'un ajout qu'il voulait coudre à l'intérieur des bouches de nos plus petits, alors que leur voûte n'était encore affectée que de simples enflures causées par des égratignures de et d'affin. Je me trouvais à la maison paralysée. À la télévision, ça braillait dans les studios. Les nôtres étaient l'objet de descentes et muselées. Je visionnais le cheval de Turin. Ce cheval, manifestement, une mutinerie muette, dans un monde sur le point de s'immobiliser. Hiver 1986. Grand-père de retour après une semaine en tôle, suspendu par les pieds, bastonné, mollet en pestant cette moisissure noire qu'il ne put jamais recracher. Son calme, une haute maison dotée de l'électricité, pas sous les mots de la révolution. Nous ne parlons que de son calme après les longues et riches heures de son sommeil. Un matin, les soldats ont fondu sur la ville comme des fourmis sur du thé renversé. Fourbus et affamés, ils ont pris d'assaut nos foyers. Nous les avons nourris. Ils crevaient de faim et venaient de loin. Les procès ont commencé la nuit qui suivit. Ils ont traîné les pères de nos enfants à la rivière. Les prenant par les cheveux, ils leur ont extrait la langue de la bouche tendue comme du boyau de chat. Certains avaient l'air mal à l'aise. Si jeune, certain. Quelqu'un a lâché une plaisanterie. Tout son rit. Restez tranquille, a murmuré quelqu'un. La rivière grondait et grondait, couvrant la plainte qui devint creuse dans nos bouches. Un autre après-midi, un garçon de 15 ans écoutait la balle. Battement de poitrine, tel un second cœur, douleur de la percussion caoutchouteuse sa façon de regarder en l'air, sa bouche s'agitant comme une huître écaillée, envie dans l'horreur qui se prolonge. Une infirmière remet en place un morceau de peau en forme de pièce de monnaie médiévale, tombée de l'aréole ou une blessure circulaire en expansion. Sa mère à ses côtés, à côté d'elle-même, « Tu as de la chance qu'il ne t'ait pas tiré dessus avec du plomb. » Toute révolution ratée est un enfant apprenant ses limites. Toute révolution est un enfant qui a grandi face au feu. Les soldats ont d'abord cru que le grondement provenait de la rivière, quelques forces répondant à la brume. Puis ils nous ont vus, 
notre meute qui se mouvait parmi les arbres. Ils ont lâché leurs armes et se sont rués vers les baraquements en ville. Le lendemain matin, au réveil, nous avons brossé nos cheveux, nous les sommes tressés les uns les autres et nous sommes mis en route. Il n'y avait pas d'autre choix. Faible bourdonnement dans les rues d'abord, puis coup de feu, poudre, sang assombrissant l'asphalte, éclat de néon, gyrophare. La nuit, les collines étaient ponctuées d'yeux, de dents, de cibles. Un matin, nous avons été réveillés par un vampire toussant dans un corps d'enfant. Odeur centenaire de taxidermie et de traité, mauvais souvenir de mise en route, avide de sang un matin au réveil, c'est la révolution, nouvelle saison d'hommes de cendre, os et chair. Avant cela, matin frais, après-midi long, humide, rêve mousson le soir, marche pendant les coupures de courant, ils ont fait l'amour comme des corbeaux électrocutés, cramés sur des lignes électriques. Avant cela, je ne les nommerai pas. Je veux que leur mort soit privée de sens, tout en repos. Nous avons vite compris à quoi nous faisions face. Une haine inimaginable. Ils nous haïssaient de la même façon qu'ils haïssaient ces autres, que nous haïssions ces autres, les bouchers, les intouchables. Nous imaginions que nous étions meilleurs. Ils nous traiteront mieux, pensions-nous. Nos nourrissons pleurèrent de faim, tandis que les premiers corps tombaient. Quelqu'un dit qu'ils ne visaient qu'au visage. Les ouvertures de nos temples donnaient sur une usine abandonnée où nos morts étaient assis autour d'un bûcher de drapeau. Pas de seigneur dans le royaume en flamme. Nous entendîmes les animaux du zoo de la ville. Un homme, torse nu, en train de s'immoler, hurla des malédictions gravissant une colline, poursuivi par ses camarades qui le battaient avec un pan de leur veste tentant d'apaiser les flammes qui encerclaient son visage. Traîné de sang épaisse comme de la peinture dans les rues, trempé, où deux bébés panda rouges sont nés en captivité le 29e jour du couvre-feu, nous leur avons donné un nom. On traînait des corps pris entre deux feux, fumés, lacrymaux, obus, balles, balancés par des gars de 20 ans, élevés à la dure, rue de petite ville, semblable aux nôtres, qu'on a d'abord armé, puis effrayé avec nous. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pair this with a short one <clears throat> um, from the second section of the book. Um, Locus Aminus. Um, This one's called Fish Cross the Border in Rain. To go down to the river with my father, he rides pillion on the old scooter singing because the breeze makes him young in the face. The dam thrown open in the kingdom across the border, the old aqueduct pulsing, gray slither of silt and gravel torn from gorges where men wear lead batteries around their necks and wait chest deep casting low voltage discs of current rounding the fish belly up to stand on the wave nipped bank as shoal after stunned shoal heave their nets The fish wake older, dreaming brief new lives, huddled in a foreign prison, gasping at each other's gills, blinded like a sack of mirrors. Descente à la rivière avec mon père. Assis à l'arrière du vieux scooter, il chante car la brise rajeunit son visage. Le barrage grand ouvert dans le royaume de l'autre côté de la frontière, le vieil aqueduc pulse une coulée grise de limon et de gravier, arrachée aux gorges où les hommes portent des batteries de plomb autour du cou, de l'eau jusqu'à la poitrine, diffusant du courant basse tension qui fait remonter en surface les ventres des poissons. 
se tenir sur la rive mordillée par les vagues, tandis que, le banc, tandis que banc après banc se soulèvent les filets. Les poissons ont vieilli au réveil, rêvant de brèves vies nouvelles, entassés dans une prison étrange, suffoquant oui contre oui, aveuglé tel un sac de miroir. Um, I read another short one, um, National Grief, um, which was written, there is an epigraph after L. Cohen, which was written on the night, on the night L Leonard Cohen's death was announced. Um, this was, uh, what, 2017, 16? Um, and uh, it basically speaks of the time. <clears throat> We grew, it's good, uh, the poem is called National Grief. We grew heavier, not with grief, but numbers, as if we had suddenly become aware of the air we stood in, as if we had only walked lightly in a dream before. We heard on the news a man had trekked seven hours across the war-torn border into Aleppo to smuggle toys for the children so they could play inside a bomb shelter. Someone heard the mad sultan's ghost weeping near the old mausoleum in Delhi. The day a man died in a stampede outside a bank. In a lab in Berlin, scientists tickled rats till they giggle to their little deaths. One morning in early November, stunned silence sealed the air of fall as if some brute had risen to power. Nervous laughter broke in corridors and all day yellow leaves emptied aspens in a feverish spell. A man drew a knife inside a city bus as the thick snow curtained the world outside in a vast wide of indifference. The quiet that followed, unlike the one that settles after the barbarians come down. History, that slow child kept working on some inf infinite homework. Deuil national. Nous croulions, non de chagrin, mais sous le nombre comme si soudain nous prenions conscience de l'air dans lequel nous évoluons. Comme si jusque-là nous avions marché d'un pas léger dans un rêve. Nous avons appris qu'un homme avait traversé sept heures durant une zone de guerre jusqu'à Alep pour apporter des jouets à des enfants dans un abri anti-aérien. Quelqu'un entendit le fantôme du sultan fou pleurer près du vieux mausolée à Delhi. Le jour où un vieil homme était mort lors d'une cohue devant une banque. Dans un labo à Berlin, des scientifiques chatouillaient des rats jusqu'à ce qu'ils rient à mort. Un matin de début novembre, un silence stupéfiant scella l'air de l'automne, comme si quelques brutes s'étaient emparés du pouvoir. Des rires nerveux éclatèrent dans les couloirs et tout au long de la journée, les trembles se dépeuplèrent fébrilement de leurs feuilles jaunes. Un homme sortit un couteau dans un bus et une épaisse neige saignit le monde extérieur d'un immense blanc d'indifférence. Le calme qui suivit n'était autre que celui qui s'installe après l'arrivée des barbares. L'histoire, cet enfant attardé, travaillait à un interminable devoir à la maison. Thank you. Um, I don't know how we are doing with time, <clears throat> but... Uh... Uh, so I just peeked in the Q&A session, right? I don't think there are questions yet. So I was looking into that. So... Uh, can we can we proceed with a, with a couple of questions? Fine. Uh, I mean, if... if, if... Uh, yeah. that's the case if people do not have any questions. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, um, Tohin, you can start the questions. Uh, then we can uh, sure, respond sure. the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mira. Uh, so barbarian is mentioned in National Grief, Rohan, right? And and that makes me think of I don't know what he uh, said about you know after Auschwitz, and he famously said that. Uh, no poetry can be written after Auschwitz, or writing poetry after Auschwitz would be barbaric, right? And in that same vein, I think Rothenberg, after a few years, said, you know, only after Auschwitz can poetry be written. Now, I understand that an event like the Holocaust or violence in that is, is, is sort of one extreme, you know, a spectrum, or at least one end of a spectrum, right? But in the first couple of sections, I see a lot of violence in the book and uh, Lucas and Minus, right? And even with King's Fiedry, uh, if you, if I noticed as a reader, right, you, the narrator is not going deep into the violence. He's just talking about it and, you know, leaves it be. Uh, there's an interesting line in this, uh, you know, poem in King's Fiedry where uh, legend remains, you know, comes when you start, when the text starts. Uh, talking about this, this all this rape and bloodbath that has happened, right? So in that sense, my question finally is that uh, uh, can, can we talk about appropriation in these poems and the fact that Eric is translating them, right? Can we talk about those things because uh, uh, because there are there are no about what, what? right about black appropriation? Hello, cultural yes. appropriation. Okay, cultural appropriation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can 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 white people write about black people? You know, uh, so so in that sense, uh, my question finally would be that how does these translations serve the poet, or or how does these translation is serving the poems? Your your poems. You know? so probably Eric can pitch in, and you can pitch in as well. Hmm. Okay, um, so uh, there was a long question. I'm trying, trying to kind of piece together. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, but uh, I'm thinking about, uh, let's start with uh, the idea that you talked about in terms of, you know, Adorno saying uh, poetry is, writing poetry after the Holocaust is barbaric, which is, you know, where, where we get into the territory of disaster poetry. How do you write about disaster, right? Um, what, how do you, shore language up after the disaster and we are in that state right now you know i mean in india we are thinking i mean thinking of like how to bring language back together again in terms of writing after you know the thing that we've just experienced you know with with the with the second wave and everything and this this theme comes up right in a way what is the appropriate way to, because there, there have been, for example, you know, 9-11 has some terrible poems written about, you know, um, and then there is Wisloa Simbor Simborska who writes that one poem, which I, I think is the only decent 9-11 poem that could be written, which is, I describe, she describes a falling man from the building and I leave you there without a last line. Or something like that, she says. So, the ethics of writing about it, right? The ethics of, of I mean, there are many ways, sort of, uh, to the the other way is to enact the language, uh, right? For example, in Zong, which talks of the the hundred something slaves that were thrown off the 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 Zong uh, ship, you know, um, uh, uh, for insurance money. Right, so uh, if you if you know the work, Zong does that thing where it just breaks up the language completely of that uh, the the trial and enacts that violence on the page. So, so I mean the str the strategies of writing about I think what Adorno was was kind of getting at was to do it right is difficult. To, to do it ethically in a way without appropriating 
that is difficult, right? Um, uh, to do it ethically without um, reiterating that violence again, you know, by by beautifying the language maybe or something like that is, is difficult. Uh, well, that is the first part of your question, right? And then, then you talked about, are you talking about in terms of, um, I That's mean, uh, then, yeah, I mean, then, then probably like I'm, I'm trying to go into, into the realms of translation and, you know, how mm -hmm. is that working? How are the translation? Uh, I mean, there are two questions, right? Does the translator serve the poet? And if, if, is that the right question or is the right question, is the translator serving the poems, the text mm -hmm. finally, right? So I think Eric, Eric can, you know, yeah, I think uh, Eric can join take in, the uh, baton ahead. Uh, Talk about yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, I will say there is there is something that is happening between English and French being translated into French is also these are two dominant languages in the scale of of translation in world translation. So, um, yeah, I would I would I would actually hear from Eric and what he thinks of that question. Well, <clears throat> th there's a long history um, between the French language and, and violence. Um, it started with, with Voltaire uh, in the 18th century um, with, with what is called the Enlightenment. Voltaire was extremely uh, violent with his language against the acts of violence. You, you probably also remember Victor Hugo uh, almost a century later uh, with the diary of a condamné à mort, of a man who was condemned to death. Uh, at another level, uh, you mentioned uh, Rohan in one of your uh, poems, the L'étranger by Camus, uh, some, some scenes of, of L'étranger are extremely marked with a sort of crude description of violence, which obviously was not uh, a pleasure uh, for Camus, but was a sort of, of necessity. And that is personally what has moved me to translate uh, uh, Rohan's poems, my favorites being those who deal, those which deal with violence, it's, it's only the language of necessity. There is no lyricism of violence, uh, not even when he um, mentions the revolutionary part. Um, there is this um, gravity, this tension that I don't think translating will add or uh, transform anything of it because it's, it's so straight a description of things that the only uh, task of the translator here is to be exact. Uh, there might be here and there a, a, a question of choice, but purely of vocabulary. And also uh, another thing which is, is very, uh, present in, that's why I, I've, I've asked you to, to show the disposition, uh, the, the, the graphic disposition of, of, of your poem, that the way uh, Rohan cuts, uh, imposes a discipline of the translator. You can't play with it. And uh, that's exactly uh, my, personal position uh, towards translation, following someone uh, I, I 
admire and, and whom I'd like to, to, to mention here, who, whose name is Pierre Léris and who is among others, the translator of uh, T.S. Eliot. He was saying, when he was asked, why is your translation so close from the original? He, he, was, he was answering, why turn things upside down? Between two languages who have so much in common, 50% of, of, the, of the words in English, you can find them in French. They have traveled. The word commerce, for instance, has traveled. And, and the, the suffix, the prefix are not exactly the same. But, but uh, prepositions are different and they're big trouble for translator. So I'm very happy that Rohan doesn't use a lot of prepositions. He doesn't use a lot of prepositions because he goes straight. It's not on and off, it's bam. I don't know if I've answered, but uh, that's... Yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. At that I thought, I mean, it reminds me of a line by Pound uh, in in a poem to Walt Whitman when he writes, "Let there be commerce between us," right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and yeah, and the, and I I understand you. What you're getting at, Tuhin, is also yeah. probably because there is um th there is something that I'm doing in terms of how bringing in this democratic space of the English poem environs and places and culture that is not written about in the English poem that often. So I'm bringing in something from the margin and foregrounding, you know, that, you know, in even in the Indian imagination, these places do not exist in writing, you know, apart from ethnographic, really ethnographic violence that has gone through, you know, very orientalist, uh, with very, you know, uh, homegrown Orientalist designs. You know, my MA thesis uh, when I was studying in Bombay was about this, about, you know, ethnographers from, the, from India, from the center writing about, uh, you know, cultures in Darjeeling and Sikkim and, and what kind of violence that went through, uh, you know. There are novelists like Kiran Desai who have written about you know, Kalimpong, this kind, this violence, this particular Gorkhalan violence that I'm talking about, Kiran Desai and writers were written from this, you know, um, from this place where they can claim a kind of very Bengali cultural claim towards the area itself, right? Because because of the, the whole tension. So so there is that sense, and I'm, what I'm trying to do is obviously there is a move here where I'm bringing in these these places, these, these culture, and I'm kind of repackaging them with everything that I have in available to me, the Greek, uh, you know, uh, the epics, you know, I have uh, the oral tradition, the, 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 the troubadour, the, the Gaine tradition from the Nepali poetic tradition, you know, the, the wandering minstrel uh, 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 tradition. And everything that I can, you know, the, the recitation of the Ramayana and, you know, all of these, whatever I can bring in, I'm using all of that and kind of foregrounding this culture, this dormant culture and sort of pushing it up and bringing it into the center, so, 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 so to say, by putting it in an English, by putting it in an Anglophone poem and writing this from America, you know, um, one of the most rapacious, you know, empire of modern era. So, so there is some, something like that happening there. And, and I think what the, the, what Eric, you know, is doing is also, that's the thing. The great thing is there is not much difference between, I'm not difference, not in terms of like, you know, but not, not, not much the difference between English and French in that way, in terms of that power relation. So, so I, I think that is the only thing that Eric is kind of, you know, bringing in, in, in is that, that kind of, that there, there is no, there is commerce, there is a direct commerce between, between when the translation happens, I think. Uh, um, and I think the, if, if that act is honored, you know, the act of bringing into the center something from the margin, 
if that much is honored, you know, I think everything gets covered too. So I don't know if that answers the second part of your questions a little more clearly to him. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. It does on many levels. Yeah, yeah. Eric, you want to add something? Yeah. I, I yeah. just would like to add something because uh, a lot of this uh, narration of violence is is told by a child. Uh, and with the relation with his grandfather and grandmother too, but the grandfather is, 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 is a main figure. And I have personal memories of my uh, childhood and my grandfather uh, telling me about the violence of the Algerian war, the, uh, which was not called, as you know, Algerian war, which was called uh, the events of Algeria. But it's very recent that in the French history of imperialism, the, the, the Alger Algerian war is called as such. And uh, I was 11 and, or 12 when I read the, the first uh, book on torture in Algeria that was published by a small publisher called Les Editions Minuit, which is the publisher of the Nouveau Roman, but first of all, a publisher that, that published the first books telling the French people about the violence exerted against the people through torture in Algeria. And reading, uh, uh, the poems of which I would call the poems of war of 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 uh, Rohan was really taking me back to to this uh, period of time, and I would say gave me a sort of responsibility to be faithful to what to, to the text, you know, not not to play at all with it, not try to embellish it, or you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So before I quickly on move on to the next question, I just want to uh, get a check on the time. Uh, Mira, are we okay with another question? Or? Yes, you can have another question, and sure. then Rohan can finish with this sure, poem. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, so another another uh, aspect about translation poetry, which I'm really uh, fascinated by, and there are uh, meager discussions happening around that, is translating as an act of translating the body, right? So uh, there there is a there is a uh, there is a talk on YouTube, a reading by Patrick Rizal and Jean Valentine, where after their reading, a man asks in the Q&A question and uh, he actually says that, you know, it has been surveyed and it has been researched that if the human body spends, you know, uh, more than a few hours of time in the woods, the body chemically changes, right? And I was really fascinated by that whole uh, trope of discussion, especially in const with the tropes of translation, right? So uh, this is probably a more direct question to Eric than Rohan that, uh, does he feel uh, this kind of uh, discomfort or exhilaration when he's translating? How does his body actually react? His, his physical body, along with his with his uh, you know intellect and the cognitive mind as well, right? Uh, because Rohan, uh, as as many of us know, he's also a translating and a Bali's poet, Avinash uh, Treshtha, and now Eric is doing it, right? And even I'm struggling with a poet that I'm currently working on. Uh, so, so that uh, discussion, translating as you know, translation of the body as well. Yeah, Eric. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the, the first time I, I, um, I related to uh, what you just mentioned was uh, translating um, Sonia's Sonia Falero's Bombay Baby. I don't know if you read that book. Uh, there's a, there's a there's a description of a, of a rape 
in this book. Uh, and there is another one, then I translated another one by her, which is called 13 Men, which is the story of the rape in rural uh, northern India. And I, on those two occasions, I, I, I literally had to, uh, to go for a walk, but to go for a long walk. Uh, because I couldn't stand uh, what I was reading. And I was thinking how repulsive it would be to have it in my own language. I would say then in my mother's language with what I read from, from uh, uh, Rohan, there is a different attitude. My body reacts differently. Because as I said, it's already familiar. Uh, this reminds me of what I read about the Algerian war. It's more or less the same attitude of the of some military forces. And there is not a, there is no connotation of sexuality. I must say that my body reacts extremely strongly with sexual violence. It's not the case here, and it's part of a lot of my readings. A lot of my readings uh, in English or in French are attached or related to uh, genocides. I've been interested in the Rwandan genocide for now more than 15 years. And uh, so, so m my body can can gently find an escape and, 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 and be back. But I must escape, yes, yes. I must escape some of uh, uh, the uh, uh, strophes. I must say that uh, the, 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 the most difficult one was, uh, was not a uh, uh, lamentation for, uh, for a failed revolution, but uh, uh, restoration elegy where maybe there is no uh, i know we won't we won't read the translation today but because because it's more evocative and i must say that if i'm ready for crude if my body is ready for crude uh, expressions of violence when uh, it sort of comes in an expected moment of more wider politic, poetical sorry, language, then my body can really be literally hurt. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really fascinating to hear, uh, Eric. Yeah. So I think uh, given the time constraints, I think it's over to you, Rowan. I still do not see any questions in the Q&A. Uh, so I would like to think that that's a good thing. So yeah, over to you, Rowan. Yeah. No, I just wanted to just add up, uh, add on to a little bit about the, the embodiment, which is which is a very interesting, uh, which I've been thinking about more and more uh, very recently about how translating someone is really to occupy that space, to embody them, their eccentric, eccentricities, you know, with language, with to to very carefully sit and see what is happening. Especially the one, the 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 poet I'm translating, Avinash Shrestha, is very interesting in that way. He's surreal, and he has these link. He's, he has these moves, the registers of the high and the low, where he makes me very very aware of of these changes of energy from line to line. So, I think 
given enough practice, you know, working within the poems of the of particular poet, you begin to kind of mimic, you begin to kind of not mimic, but to, um, to, to generate a mimicking, uh, you know, um, like, a, like a, a, a working style where, where you, uh, you begin to sort of know what what's going on like where or why why they would say why they would say something like that and especially in uh, i don't know if in my poems uh how much eric feels that but especially with sparse lyric stuff you feel that much more i think so embodiment embodying is i think a, a very um interesting way to translate someone i think i think i i i honestly really think taking that leap you know vivek narayanan uh, says translation is soul fusion technology you know um and i think that's a very interesting way to put it because it really is that in a way you know it is that kind of soul fusion where where you where you are trying to i mean it's something it's something there's something mysterious about it too you know uh, as much as we try to say um but there is something there's something kindred about being able to translate you know um uh, and eric saying it reminds him of these certain memories and that is i think that is the place where translation begins where that that kinship is suddenly sort of lit right when you read someone and something is lit and then you you try to then you try to work from that you know um so yeah i think i think I think the translation of the body, if what you mean in that sense, is is very much um, is very much present as I as I grapple with with the problems of translation in general. True. Yeah, and part of the process, right? Yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think Robin can take over. Uh, yeah. Um, Some more poems, yeah. maybe, yeah. Uh, let me just come in for a second here. Yeah. Uh, because we like to end with the poet and not with me talking. So let me say my thank yous on behalf of Prakriti Foundation. Thank you to everyone in the audience who made the time to come today to listen to this evening of poetry and poetry and translation as well. Uh, we appreciate that it, there are many, many demands on your time and that you came, that you chose to come and spend time with us. We're flattered, we thank you, and we hope that you will come back again uh, for the future events. Next weekend, we have the final uh, edition of our year-long retrospective of Manjula Padmanabhan's per plays and performance pieces. We've been doing this with a different director once a month on the last Saturday of every month. Um, and this time, it would mostly the other, uh, iterations of that festival have been a different director interpreting Manjula's plays and performance pieces each time. We will conclude with Manjula herself putting on a show for us. Uh, that is next Saturday. Please do join us for that. And then, you know, in, uh, we did say that Poetry with Prakriti online will be October last year to October this year, but we are carrying on. There will be more poetry till at least December. And if we can work out the logistics of it among Prakriti's other priorities for a few months further into 2022. So we hope you will continue to come back and be part of this poetry community. Thank you everyone for coming in. Thank you uh, Prakriti Foundation on behalf of the audience for this festival. It has just been a year of poetry poets every week, being able to talk, to listen to them, to listen to poetry, to listen to conversation about their process, about everything, and it's been beautiful. And specifically today, uh, thank you, Duhin, uh, for moderating this event. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for joining us and for your translations. I'm going to sort of risk embarrassment and say merci, and hope I got that right. And uh, thank you, Rohan for this lovely evening of poetry. And uh, after Rowan and Eric do this last poem, 
I'm going to ask everyone to please turn on your cameras so that we can take a little webcam shot for the Prakriti archives. But for now, all thank yous done. And Rohan, please let us end with one more poem. Thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to finish with Meza Voce, which is the last poem in the book. I don't know if Eric has uh, got to Me Meza Voce yet uh, in his translations, but um, I generally read this because it's the last poem. It also kind of, uh, it's a kind of an anabasis, which is the coming out into the light uh, from the catabasis that begins. Um, I would like to think it is a poem about light and uh, some kind of light. And um, I wouldn't so go so far as to say hopeful, but there's some form of light and, and this is the coming out into that. All summer, the half voice lurked behind me and I played deaf for days for to live, to not write about it, to use my body, part the river's flesh to operate. Machinery is human too to love and for one stay awake through it all. Now it comes like the deer sleeved out of the green in clean staccato, all corpusal and hunger. No, not the deer, the ravens calling for the wolves to split, open the light from the dead deer's belly, jeweled in the dark purse of its pelt. We are each given heaven for grief so heavy. We put it down, dance small around it. Thank you. And um, I would like to say thank you to Prakriti Foundation for having me for uh, bringing Eric and me together. We have never done this. Uh, we've just been talking over emails over these years. Um, and this is just wonderful to be able to hear Eric read alongside me. And thank you to Heen for taking this on and being such a good sport about it and um, for asking very interesting and very penetrating questions uh, that made me think about, you know, uh, this whole business of translation that we're, this commerce that we are we are having here. Um, I'm sorry if I've missed any other um, um, people, organizations to thank, but I am very grateful to be here sharing my poems today um, with everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry, I did forget to say thank you to uh, Alliance Francaise and oh, yes. uh, French Embassy. Uh, my apologies for that. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, if all of you could give me your best smiles for one final photograph. All right. And thank one, you. Thank you. Two. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Have a great